Hey folks, welcome back to your recorded lectures for ML103. Uh, this is the Fantasy North, Skyrim, and God of War. Now, this lecture and the next one are going to be a little bit shorter, most likely, because they are just meant to serve as basic introductions to the three case study games that we're going to be looking at. Uh, I'm going to assume that there are probably a large number of you who are familiar with at least some of these games. Uh, if not, this should provide you with a basic grounding in what they're about. Certainly, if you want to um, sort of, you know, get more well-versed with them, there are plenty of Let's Plays and clips available on YouTube. Uh, we are going to be watching clips uh, at the Zoom sessions, so that should help as well. Um, of course, if you want to uh, pick up these games and play them along with uh, the course, that has been known to happen before. Uh, when this course was originally just about Skyrim, had a number of people that played Skyrim along with the course and had a lot of fun doing it. All right, so I've grouped Skyrim and God of War together for this first of the two uh, introductory uh, bits, just because they they are similar in that they are both fantasy games. Uh, they are not games that are rooted in historical reality. Uh, Skyrim is purely neo-medieval. God of War, you know, it does use um, real Greek and uh, Scandinavian mythology, but not much in the way of actual history, obviously. All right, I want to begin by just a quick review of what Northern Medievalism actually is. I know we only covered this last week, but I really want to kind of hammer this home because it is so important. So it is a specific type of medievalism that romanticizes or valorizes the history and culture of the medieval North. So this is Northern Europe in late antiquity and the early Middle Ages, the so-called Dark Ages. Now, I would actually modify that slightly these days because I think that some of the games that tap into Northern medievalism actually subvert the romanticism of it. And God of War is actually one of them. We'll talk about that in more detail later in the term. But th this type of medievalism is not chivalric in nature, and that's important. You don't get uh, knights in shining armor and damsels in castles and that sort of thing. It is also a type of medievalism that can equally be present in neo-medievalist texts. It doesn't have to be in a historically based game. All right, so the oldest of the games we're looking at, and certainly the most influential on the genre as a whole, is Skyrim, which is actually the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Um, it is set in the titular province of Skyrim, which is a northern province of Tamriel, uh, the secondary world of the Elder Scrolls. Skyrim is home at this point in its history to a people known as the Nords, and they are very clearly modeled after the Scandinavians or the Vikings. There's a lot of complex history behind it. They are not the original inhabitants of Skyrim, and uh, they are also not a colonized people, which is important. Um, it's, it's easy to misinterpret the, the story of Skyrim if you think the Nords were colonized, but they, they weren't, actually. The game focuses on a figure known as the Dragonborn, who is a customizable protagonist, in that you can pick uh, race, gender, appearance. Uh, you can decide to tailor the character however you want. Is your Dragonborn going to be a mage, a fighter, a thief slash assassin? all of the above, uh, <laughs> they are a blank slate. And so this is one of the styles of protagonists that you will often see in medievalist games. The Dragonborn is basically uh, a mortal being with the soul of a dragon, and they are caught up in uh, a prophecy. Uh, the prophecy has to do with a giant evil dragon known as Alduin, the World Eater who is literally going to eat the world and end the world. And the Dragonborn is meant to stop them. Now, as I said, you can pick anyone you like to be the Dragonborn. Honestly, it works best with a Nord. There is so much more resonance in the story if your Dragonborn is a Nord. Um, feel free to disagree with me about that. In fact, I'd love to hear what you guys think about that comment at our Zoom session. But... Uh, 
you know, there's uh, there are some inconsistencies that develop. If, for instance, your dragonborn is um, one of the the non-human races, basically, you know, what what the heck is an Altmer, a high elf, doing as a dragonborn? Why do they care what happens to Skyrim? Now, one of the other major aspects of Skyrim's storyline is the Stormcloak Rebellion. So this is an uprising amongst the Nord population against the Empire. And this is where oftentimes Skyrim is read as, uh, you know, rising, a colonized people rising up against their colonizers. But it's not the truth, because the Nords were actually deeply involved in the Empire. A lot of the major NPCs on both sides of the Stormcloak Rebellion are Nord veterans of the Imperial Legion. Uh, you don't have to take part in this rebellion, in this civil war. You can choose which side to be on. Are you going to be one of the um, the racists? Because frankly, the, the Stormcloaks are scary uh, ethno-nationalists. Um, are you going to be uh, working with the Empire, which maybe has better intent, but it, which is also religiously repressing the Nords and causing most of the problems that way? Uh, neither side really covers himself with glory. So I, I've known many people who have avoided playing the Civil War plotline completely, uh, but it does raise some interesting issues, especially on the medievalism level. Again, the game is purely neo-medieval, but it is influenced by Scandinavian and Germanic culture. Uh, its northern medievalism is a bit more broadly based than it appears. It's not just about fantasy Vikings. There is a lot more at work. Um, one of my first published articles on gaming talked about uh, the Nords actually being more akin to the so-called barbarian peoples at the end of the Roman Empire, where they're welcomed into the empire, but then are not treated well and rise up against it. So that's a quick introduction to Skyrim. Let's talk briefly about God of War. So this is a game that was released in 2018 and uh, it was the eighth installment in the series, the fourth major installment. Technically, this is God of War 4, a direct uh, eventual sequel to God of War 3. Uh, the early uh, installments of God of War were all set in mythic Greece, as I said. And Atreus, the so-called ghost, uh, sorry, Kratos, the so-called ghost of Sparta, uh, basically goes to war with the rest of the Olympian pantheon. God of War 2018 picks up many years later when Kratos has escaped and taken refuge in mythic Scandinavia. Um, it picks up after his wife, Faye, has just died. And her last request was that Kratos and their son, who is a cute little guy called Atreus, uh, very good with a bow, um, take her ashes and scatter them from the uh, summit of the highest peak in the realms, which they think is the mountain that they can see from their house. It's not. It's a lot more complicated than that. The, uh, the game is making use of the story of Ragnarok, the Twilight of the Gods. And in fact, both um, Skyrim and God of War make use of the idea of Ragnarok. They do so in very different ways. Uh, God of War's take on Ragnarok, as we will see when we discuss Ragnarok in excruciating detail in a couple of weeks, uh, is a lot more true to the actual mythology in that it is inevitable and uh, Kratos and Atreus get caught up in it, whether they like it or not. Uh, you do see several of the other realms uh, in God of War. It is a beautiful game, by the way, if you have not played it. It's just incredible on the visual level. On the visual level. It also has a really unique visual technique where cutscenes move smoothly into action scenes. There's no like loading screen. And you also get like an over-the-shoulder camera, which is uh, pretty cool for the actual fighting scenes. It's, uh, it is really uh, an action-adventure game with strong RPG elements. It's not necessarily a full-on open-world RPG. There's a little bit more restriction to it. But it is an enormous achievement of gaming art. And uh, uh, Santa Monica Studios should be incredibly proud of it. I'm looking forward so much to the next one, which apparently is called Ragnarok. So we know what's happening there. 
All right, so just in closing, I wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of realism in fantasy games. And uh, I'm pulling on uh, what's well, actually was a PhD dissertation written by a scholar, Victoria Cooper, on Skyrim. And it was absolutely groundbreaking. Um, so fascinating, the stuff that she had to say about Skyrim. I've made use of it in so many different things since. Unfortunately, um, her work came to the attention of the right-wing blogosphere, and she underwent numerous months of absolutely appalling online abuse, and so she is not actively publishing at the moment, which is really, really sad. Yes, she made the mistake of being outwardly and noticeably female and commenting on gaming, which is, you know, you're taking your life in your hands, basically. And that's, I almost, when I, I first started uh, publishing, I almost went by my initials instead, but then I figured, no, that was cowardly, and I wasn't doing that. So she talks about what makes for a realistic fantasy game, and since she's talking about it in the context of Skyrim, what she's really talking about is what makes a realistic medieval fantasy game. And her definition is interesting. She talks about consistency, willingness to uphold its own rules, it's all very true, consistency with Western cultural norms. So the pseudo-feudal structure, the warrior code, I could go on. She also says recognizable and or believable people, beliefs, sorry, material culture, landscape, and history. And when she talks about this sort of northern flavored medievalism, her argument is that it is so popular because it gives people what they expect. It gives them something that feels familiar, again. And I think that is just perfect in its simplicity as an argument. Now, she goes a little bit farther than I would. She says that elements of medieval history and culture are often used only as set dressing, is her phrase, to make the game world seem more believable. And I actually think they're more important than that. Uh, she and I differ, for instance, on uh, religion in Skyrim and the role it plays in the narrative. But that is something we'll talk about at a uh, different lecture. So again, this is just a quick introduction to the two games and maybe a few more concepts about how to approach them. Um, I will be back shortly with your other introduction, which is a little bit more lengthy, to a game which is also a little bit more lengthy, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Thanks very much, guys.